And turn in your Bibles to Matthew. I can tell I'm out of shape because I'm a little bit out of breath from playing that song. Oh my gosh. Matthew, uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew, where are we at? Chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We are continuing today in our series called Intentional. And I look around the room and I see that there are some of you here that haven't been here in a while, some of you that are visiting. And so just real quickly, I want to bring everybody up to speed on where we're at in this series. So we're in a year-long series, or kind of more of a theme. It's called 2017 Life with Jesus. And what we're doing is we're, we're going through the year, and basically each month we have a new word to define life with Jesus. And that's what all of these words are that you see. These are all different series that we've done in an effort to define a life with Jesus. This month, the word is intentional. It's the small word that you see below the screen behind me. Being intentional. And what we're doing is each week, we're using a, a, a different F word to describe being intentional with our life with Jesus. The first weekend of this series, what we talked about was being intentional with our future. With our future. And by that, what we mean is being intentional with our time. Life is going crazy busy, isn't it? It's crazy out of control busy. And if we're not intentional with it, all of a sudden we wake up, and if you're anything like me, you wake up and you're 30 years old, and you wonder where the time has gone. It's like, what, what in the world happened here? And, <laughs> but that's how fast time goes, if we're not intentional with it. And I think the part of that series that has stuck with me the most, or the part of that message, was the fourth point of that message. Asking the question, are you kingdom-minded with your time? And here's really what I meant by that, was, in this room I look around, and I know most of you, and I would say that the majority of us in this room, we're believers. We believe in salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I look around. Maybe there's a couple of you that would, aren't quite there yet, but the majority of us would agree with that statement. But here's what, here's what that statement means. What that statement means is that we are saved only by faith in Jesus. And if you don't put your faith in Jesus, you're going to spend an eternity in hell. That's what that statement means. As a Christian, as a Bible-believing follower of Jesus, that's what I believe. That statement I just made is a heavy statement. And I think oftentimes in the church, for whatever reason, we face that statement with complacency. Because if we really understood the urgency of the words that just came out of my mouth, we're talking about eternity. Not 90 years. A long life is 90 years. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that this life is but a vapor. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. We're talking about eternity. Salvation through faith in Jesus alone. And the question as, as believers that I pose to us is, how much of your time is spent investing in the kingdom and investing in an opportunity for other people to know this Jesus who we believe is the only way to spend eternity in heaven? Being kingdom-minded with our time. If we really believe the weight of that message, ask yourself that question. Where do you spend your time? And are you intentional with it based on what you believe? Are you kingdom-minded with it? So that was the first F word we talked about, was our future. The second F word we talked about was our friends. Being intentional with our friends. And it's a challenging thing because in the day and age that we live right now, we put so much more emphasis on the quantity of friends we have as opposed to the quality of friends we have. And, and part of this is, it's a social media thing, I think. This is just my opinion. I think it's a social media thing. Because we, we boast how many followers we have on Twitter and how many this is we have on Snapchat and Instagram. And... The 500 or 1,000, or for some of you, you're so stinking popular. You might have 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 friends on Facebook. I heard someone say recently they knew that there was a breakdown in their relationship with this person because they unfriended them on Facebook. And that, that's the 
definition of friendship and not friendship is, are we friends on Facebook? And so we look at the quantity more so than the quality, but the Bible is very clear. And uh, I believe it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, bad company corrupts good character. Don't, don't fool yourself, Paul says. Bad company corrupts good character. Are we more focused on the quantity than the quality of the people that we allow to influence our lives? And I know that's not an easy thing to address because a lot of us find our security and our worth and our value from the number of friends we have. And if we actually stand up on a moral principle or a, a lifestyle choice, then we might lose some of those friends. And we just can't handle the thought of that. And that was the challenge that day. Are you kingdom-minded when you think about your friends, when you think of those who you allow to influence your life and paint on the canvas of your life? And it's interesting because I see Miranda over here, and I see Dominic back there, and Verna in the back row, and I think just of our young people. See what I did there? Okay. Verna's letting, letting me bow hunt on her land, and so there's going to be a lot of kissing up happening in the next three months. A lot. But, but I see these young people, and it's easy in a message like that to think, well, that's great for kids that are in high school or college. But friends, it's true for all of us, whether we want to admit it or not. Every one of us struggle with that. The idea of, am I going to be able to live and exist and find worth and value if I don't have 30 or 40 people that I call my closest friends, even though I know that they talk poorly about me when I'm not standing in the room? Even though I know that if I confide something in them, I'm doing so knowing they're going to go tell people, but I can't stand the thought of not having all of these friends, and so I'm willing to compromise this because I, can't, I just have to have them. And the challenge is, consider the quality of the people that you allow to influence your life. Are they trustworthy? Do they share your morals and values? Do they treat you nicely to your face? Do they treat you nicely when you're not standing there? But, but consider your friends and be intentional with them. That was the second F word. The third F word, last week we talked about being intentional with our faith. And, and, and I enjoyed that message because it re-emphasized the importance of the basic principles, the basic disciplines of our Christianity. I had a, a football and a basketball up here, and, and, and the, the point I was trying to make was with this football... There's this old quarterback, probably in his 50s now. His name is Bet Brett Favre, if you, just in case you don't know how to pronounce it. Brett Favre. <laughs> Pam's doing everything she can right now to bite her tongue. She's like the, the Green Bay Packer fan of all. I wouldn't be saying that if Phil was here, just so you know. If Tasha's husband Phil was here, I wouldn't be making fun of Brett Favre. The rest of you guys, I don't care about Phil. He takes his stuff seriously. I possibly would be dead right now. But here's this old quarterback, Brett Favre, and if you were to go watch Mr. Favre in practice, in training camp, you would see him doing stuff that probably he's been doing since before he could walk. Because these guys, that are, they're, they're, they've mastered their craft to that point where they can play in the NFL or the NBA or, or baseball or soccer. They have been doing this since like before they could walk. Passing a football. I'll bet he could, he could throw a, a perfect spiral before he could talk clearly, before he could walk, before he could run. Just a guess. And if you were to now go see him in practice, he's probably 65 years old now. If you were to go watch him in practice, do you know what you would see him doing? You'd see him throwing the football. And the wide receivers, do you know what you'd see them doing? You'd see them bouncing their feet through tires, You'd see them catching the ball. The offensive line, the defensive line, you know what they're doing over and over again? They get down like this, and it cracks me up, and then they just hit things. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying, though? By being intentional with our faith, what we're doing is we're looking at reading the Bible, we're looking at praying, we're talking about worshiping. All of these things that we forget because what we're after is what's up in the clouds. We're looking for the gold dust and, and the wings and, and the angels and all of these things. 
Great. But, but those things aren't Monday mornings at work when you're struggling. Those things aren't Friday evening when you're tempted beyond what you can imagine and, and God is giving you a way out. If you don't have a close relationship with Him, you're going to miss that way out that God has just given you. And how do you get that? The same way a quarterback can throw that pass that weeds its way through because it's part of everyday life. And that's being intentional with our faith, our faith, not just showing up on Sundays, but every day, being intentional with the basic disciplines of our faith. Our future, our friends, our faith. And today what we're going to talk about is we're going to kick off a couple-part series. We're going to talk about being intentional with our finances. Being intentional with our finances. And right now, just saying that some of you you're irritated. Because here's the church again talking about finances. And I just want to make something very clear to you guys. I have nothing to gain by this message. I don't. Personally, I have nothing to gain by it. Financially, the church is doing just fine. We're not struggling to pay our bills. I don't, I'm not going to get a raise. Nothing, nothing personal is going to benefit me by talking about finances. We're going to talk about biblical principles as we talk about finances for the next six months. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> How are we doing as individuals financially in this country? I looked some of these statistics up, and this is mind-blowing to me. As individuals in this country, we are over 12 trillion dollars in debt. Over 12 trillion dollars in personal debt. And that's not including corporate debt, local, state, or federal government debt. This is just personal debt in this country. And now as of Thursday, the population in the United States was 324,975,983 people as of Thursday. So by now, I don't know how many more that is. Ron, Sharon, anything we need to know? Okay, all right, just checking. So we're still at that, or give or take. And so here's what it breaks down to, and here's why I said that. Because that 12 plus trillion, 320 some million people, that, that estimates down to approximately $38,000 in personal debt for every man, woman, and child living right now. And now here's the thing, I know some of you. you, you have managed your money just ridiculously awesome, you've been on top of it, you have no debt. And you're sitting there going, ha, Pastor Bill, that, that's not me. That, that's it's great, because that means I have yours. <laughs> Which is awesome. But it paints a good picture, because I know some of you in this room, you have no debt. You've worked hard, you've been intentional, and you have no debt. So what that means is there are some people with $70,000 in debt. $140,000 in debt, $280,000 in debt. And that's where we find ourselves. And now there's a part of this that I think adds a little more strain to it as I'm talking to the church, my believing friends and family. Of the 320 some million people that live in the United States, 280 million of us call ourselves Christians. That means that we carry the same debt, if not more, than those who have no faith in Jesus. And I think that's a problem. Friends, are we being intentional with our finances? I know when I was younger, in my early 20s, I had a checkbook, paper you write on and you give to the cashier, Dominic, thinking of these kids, Alex, someday you'll go to a museum and you'll see a checkbook in the museum. I had a checkbook and my mindset was as long as there's checks, I got money. <laughs> now today things have changed a little bit. The world we live in now, it's... If I got my card, oh, that's my hunting license, put that back. If I got my credit card, I got money. 
And all too often what we look at when we go online and look at our bank statements, our credit card statements, we see two words. And when we see these two words, then we look at the number after that. Available balance. And as long as there is something positive beyond that, I still got money to spend. And that's how, friends, we get ourselves in a $12 trillion problem, is because we're not intentional with it. You see, we live in a world where it's abundance. We talked about this when we talked about time. You and I, we don't consider the value of our time because we live in a world, in a society, in a culture of abundance. I'm looking around this room, and I don't see anybody who's probably missed any meals recently. We don't know what it means to really go without. Food, water. Imagine if we lived in a world where you could only take a two-minute shower because you had to conserve your water. I'd be crabby. I just want you to know that. Or your bath. You could only put two inches of water in your bath. And if it got cold and you fell asleep, that's, you can't add any more. We live in a world and in a culture where there's an abundance of everything, and honestly, we have that same mindset when it comes to our money, when it comes to our finances. There's always more. There's always more. And, and, and then you put on top of it the pressure of looking a certain way and having certain things. And, and it's just like uh, there's just something missing in all of that, especially as believers. We should be set apart. My understanding as I read the Bible, I should be set apart. By the lifestyle I live, I should be set apart. By the way I treat people, and I should be set apart by what I do with my finances. By, by what I do with my, my money. And when I see 280 million of 320 million, I don't think we're doing a very good job of being set apart with our money. And I want to challenge us today briefly to be intentional with our finances. I asked you to turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, and I want to read a little bit, starting in verse 19. And there's a few things that are in this chunk of Scripture that I think are, are pretty interesting to challenge us about our finances. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, and I'm reading from my NLT version, so if yours is a little different, that's why says this, don't store up for treasures here on earth. And if you have a Bible that has red letters, that means Jesus is, is speaking here. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroy them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. And I, wanna, I, wanna, I really want to push us today as a church and step on our toes a little bit. I don't want to offend anybody personally, but I, I want the Word of God to challenge us. I want the Holy Spirit to convict us and Him to stir in us a little bit with what we're doing with our finances. And so if you, if you would say that the church is the most important part, that my faith is the most important thing in my life, I want to challenge you with something. Put it to the test. I want you to look at your check register. Go look at your debit card bank statement. Go look at your credit card statement. And you will see what's important to you, what the desires of your heart are. I would say that in this room, on the surface, every one of us would agree that our desire is for people to know Jesus. Amen? Amen. Awesome. <laughs> you just poured fuel on my fire. Because if that's the desire of your heart, as we go back and look at our check registers, how much does where you put your treasures reveal the desires of your heart? If the desire of your heart is for people to know Jesus, and you give nothing to the kingdom, it's not the desire of your heart. You're paying lip service to it. You, you know it's the right answer, and so you say it. But it's not real. If you see your mortgage is $2,000 and your car payment is $500 and the sea due payment is $300 and the bike payment is $200, we'll keep that one. 
your internet payment, and your all down the list, your cell phone payment. We got a family plan. Plan it costs us eight hundred dollars a month because there's two adults and four kids, and and so as you go down the list. Is that what you're seeing? Because I'm going to tell you something. According to the Word of God, not Bill's opinion, but according to the Word of God, those are the desires of your heart. Church. Believers in Jesus. You go to hell if you don't put your faith in Jesus. We pay lip service. The desires of my heart are to have as big a house as I can afford because I have to impress my brother-in-law or my parents or this, this guy I graduated with who made fun of me and thought I would never succeed. The desires of my heart are to drive a fancy truck because of the guys at work. It's challenging. When you put it to the test, it's challenging. Don't trust what comes out of your mouth, friends. Look at the receipt. Where are you storing up your treasures? Verse 22 says this, Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. So here's what that all means. Because that's kind of weird. I mean, you're talking about finances and money and treasures and all this stuff, and then all of a sudden you're talking about my eyes and being good and bad. And, and here's what that means. If you look up those words, the, the good eye or the healthy eye, or the bad eye, or the unhealthy, what you're going to find in its deeper definition is generous versus stingy. If you have a generous eye, if you can look out, and, and here's, here's what this is, you can look out and with your eyes, with a generous eye, you are, you are able to see the need. You're able to see what's out there. Out of that generous eye, out of that light that is there, that's inside of you, now you want to meet that need. Why? Because you're looking with good eyes. And I, and I think about these, this song that, that Denise sang tonight, talking about our eyes. God, give me your eyes to see. And that, that's kind of my prayer tonight for us as a church. Not me as an individual or you as an individual, but for us as a, as a church, that we would have good eyes not bad eyes, that we wouldn't be stingy. We wouldn't be storing up for ourselves treasures on earth by being stingy, but that we would see the need and that we would have good eyes. God, give me spiritual eyes to see the need. And out of the abundance that you have blessed me with, let me be generous with that. Because if we miss that, with these bad eyes, if I can't see that, how deep is the darkness in me? How deep does the level of selfishness that I have run? When I live in a world where I'm more concerned about the size of my house, the size of my truck, the fancy vacations, and I'm not saying those things are bad. Please don't hear that. What I'm saying is, is, if, if your check register reveals you have all of those and once every six months you give something to God, yep, I want to challenge you from the Word of God. Don't be stingy. Don't be unhealthy. Don't have bad eyes. God, I want to have good eyes. Romans chapter 12 talks about being transformed by the renewing of our minds. See, friends, this isn't a condemning message. This is a, a, revel, a revealing message. God, if, is this where I'm at? Am I storing up treasures on earth because of my insecurities? Am I stingy because of my pride? Am I missing this because I don't have your eyes? 
Because I want to serve you. I want to worship you. I want to glorify you with every aspect of my life, with everything that I have. I want to glorify you. God, give me good eyes. God, God, change this inside of me. Renew my thinking. Help me not find my worth and value in Al's acceptance of what I own, but in, but in your pleasure in, in how I live and what I do with what you give me. God, give me good eyes. He goes on, Jesus, to talk about this in just a couple more verses here. He goes on and he says this. He says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And if you put those three different chugs, you, you put them in the context of where they're at, and ask yourselves the question, who are you serving? And this word serve, it's very interesting to me because this word serve, I don't think we get this word serve, to be honest with you, because of, again, the world we live in. This is a time and an experience of, of kings, rulers and leaders, the pharaohs, the governors. These people understood this terminology of of giving your allegiance, of surrendering your life. It, it made a lot more sense. And I think even, even in some of our Middle Eastern countries, our third world countries, where you see a different level of, of movement of God, I think, I think those people understand this more because they get this being a subject to a king. In this word serve, you look it up and you find it in, in, its, in this Greek, and what you see is, that what it comes down to is being a slave to. So let's rephrase this. You cannot be a slave, you listen to what I'm saying, you cannot be a slave to two people. You cannot tell Jason you're going to be his slave, and Dick you're going to be his slave. You can only be a slave to one. Who are you a slave to? Not who do you serve in, in the sense that we, we do. It's just kind of this, it's out there word of serving. But who are you a slave to? Who have you committed your allegiance to? Who do you call yourself a subject of? Who have you surrendered to? And, I, and again, not just in the right answer church world that we live in here, but if before everybody... What if your check register was put on the Tron? What would we see? Are you a slave to God? Or are you a slave to money? To things? And I bring it back all the way around to the debt that we have, most of us. This debt kills us because we are a slave to that debt. And what we do when it comes time to give our offerings, to give our tithes, to give to the kingdom, to give, to bring it to God, what we do is that's at the bottom. And our response is, if I can afford it. If there's enough left over, what's at the top? It's the mortgage, it's the car payment, it's the insurance on the expensive car payment, it's the insurance on the cabin, it's, an, it's the Netflix, the Amazon Prime, the cell phone, the internet, all the way down to, yeah, I'm sorry, God, not this month either. Because I'm a slave to these things. And that's the real look at who are you a slave to? Who are we a slave to? God or money? Who do we serve? God or money? Now here's what I believe is I look around this room and I know that there is a lot of debt in this room. I, I know that. And I know that we have hearts. Every one of us, our heart says, God, I want to serve you. God, I want to be a slave to you in every aspect of my life. That's my heart's desire. 
then friends, I want to encourage you with something. I want to encourage you to seek the Lord even in this conversation. I want to encourage you. Don't unspiritualize money. We, we, we separate this stuff out. I understand seeking the Lord when I need, need help in my marriage. I understand seeking the Lord when I need help with my children. I understand seeking the Lord to pray for the lost. I understand praying for this and praying for that. And, and I get worshiping God. Don't minimize the spiritual principle of managing our finances. And how when we, when we miss this or when we separate this from our church world because we think it's none of the church's business. It's none of your business, Pastor Bill, what I do with my finances. You know what? You're right. I, it's not. But it's God's. If you call yourself a Christian, if you have surrendered your life to Him, and you say, I want to worship you, God, with my heart, with my mind, and with my strength, then it's absolutely His business. And in the same way that you say, God, help me stop looking at these images on my computer screen. The same way that you say, God, help me, help me stop talking to my wife this way. Help me stop treating my husband this way. God, give me patience. Give me, give me kindness. In the same way, you say, God, help me with my self-control. Help me with my pride. Because those things feed our finances going out of control. God, I, I want to worship you with, with every aspect of my life. God, I want to serve you. I want to be a slave to you in every aspect of my life. Every aspect. When I pay my bills, God, I, I want you to be first. And if I get to the bottom and, God, there's not enough to pay an internet bill, then you know what? I'm going to go without internet in my house until I rearrange things. God, if I get to the bottom and there's not enough to have the unlimited data, text, phone, everything, phone plan, then you know what? I'm going to simplify it down to, I just need to be able to make calls. And if I get to the bottom and I realize I can't afford three vehicles, then you know what? I'm really, really going to sacrifice. And I'm going to get rid of one. If I realize I can't afford the cabin, then you know what? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this decision. But do you understand what I'm saying? God, help me. God, help me reframe and transform the way I think. I'm not going to let the pressures of what my culture says I need to have dictate my finances any longer because I want to honor you, because I want to put you first, because I want to be kingdom-minded with my finances. And you guys, what I want to do, and again, I, I want you to understand this is a spiritual principle, and I know we have times at the end of our services where we contemplate our lifestyles, where we contemplate our addictions, and we say, God, would you break these chains that bind me would you help me quit smoking? Would you help me quit drinking? Would you repair this relationship? Would you reconcile this? Would you open this door? Would you call me into service? And we, we spend time, we take, we take time out of our busy schedule to seek the Lord in this. And I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to take this, the elephant that's over here that nobody wants to touch. It's our finances. I want you to bring it over and I want you to plop it dead center in the middle of your relationship with God. Right there. And I want you to pray just for a moment. We're not going to drag this out, and I want to ask you to not move yet. But in just a moment, I'm going to sit down and stop talking, and Tasha's going to play, and for 30 seconds, I want you to do something. I want you to ask God, would you break the chains that bind me financially? Would you break the chains that have me so shackled that God, as I look, I see, and, and my register doesn't reflect truly the desires of my heart, so would you break these chains, and, and would you heal me of this? Help me find my security in you instead of in these treasures that moth and rust will destroy.